The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. One of the long-delayed reactions to an early near-death experience can be a fascination with the gifts they sometimes bring. Not only gifts that we've received, but gifts other NDEers may have received as well. That curiosity has certainly been true for me, and also for our guest on today's program, who has been exploring the notion that the famous psychic, Edgar Casey had a near-death experience as well. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Our guest today, Neil Helm, was reared close to the Montana-North Dakota border in a farm ranch setting. He had a near-death experience at age five when he drowned in a hot spring in central Montana. It profoundly changed his life, and Neil developed a personal relationship with God that exists to this day. At age 17, he joined the Army Security Agency and was assigned to the U.S. team that tracked Sputnik 1 on the day it was launched. Day one of the space age was the beginning of a 40-plus year career in space science that took him to all the corners of the globe, working with space scientists, astronauts, and cosmonauts. One of his early seminal research projects was on the use of space-based communications and GPS technologies for both disaster mitigation and search and rescue. His systems are still in use today and are credited with saving many thousands of lives. For this research and development, he was nominated for a Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize. From 1990 to 2008, Neil was at the George Washington University, where he directed a space research center. He's a member of the International Academy of Astronauts, an expert witness to congressional committees. He has authored uh, or co-authored four books and has published more than 40 technical papers. He has a BSFS degree from Georgetown and an MA from Atlantic University and is finalizing a PhD program in transpersonal psychology at Sophia University in California. Neil is currently the scholar in residence at Atlantic University in Virginia Beach, Virginia, where he conducts research and assists faculty and students with their research projects. He also serves on the board of the Virginia Beach chapter of IANS. Neil, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you, Lee. I'm really pleased and honored to be here today. Oh, it's wonderful to have you. N Neil, let's begin with the story of your own near-death experience. Well, thank you, yes. Um, 1944, um, the Allies had invaded Normandy, and my mother thought that we could finally take a little vacation. And so my two older brothers, myself and my mother, went out to visit uh, a cousin. We called her an aunt, but in, in, she's really a cousin in central Montana, and she was a physician and had at the time three sort of hospitals that she was um, directing. And we were driving from one hospital to another in a rural setting, and she just pulled off the road to what looked like a barn. And she opened the doors, and inside it was quite a crude hot spring. The water had come out of the ground at 100 degrees. I don't need to give you all the details. But anyway, it was sort of a place where the local ranchers had made it, and it was a swimming place, and so we went swimming, just the five of us, my two older brothers, my mother, and my aunt, and in those days, there was not a lot of electricity, so it was quite dark, and I had never been swimming. I was sort of frustrated that my that my brothers and everyone could swim, and I couldn't, and so I tried to swim, and I failed. With a, with a few strokes, I was going down, and I remember my last thought was how painful it's going to be to die of, of drowning. And at that second, a real serenity and peace came over me, and I changed. I left my body, had an out-of-body experience, um, went up, went to a beautiful meadow, crossed the meadow, across a beautiful lake, into a tunnel, into a mountain, and, and this, there was no, this whole thing was so serene and so beautiful the word for it is ineffable. We can't find the words to describe how beautiful this was. And through the tunnel, and I could see the light at the end of it, and when I got there, the whole right wall was this light that's extremely unique. I've, 
I've seen it on occasions, and again, it's it's in that true sense of the word unique. And the light manifested itself as God. I am the light of God. And at five years old, I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and I stood in front of that light, and it just sort of poured over me like a mist of fine mist of, of spray. And it was just love and forgiveness. And I stood there, and, and on the other side, there was no real space or time. I don't know how long I stood there. And then the light said to me, it is not your time. Five words, it is not your time. And being five, I certainly wasn't going to argue with it. And back I came into my physical body, and my brother dove into the hot spring, physically hit me, and knew that no one should be under the water and pulled me up. And my aunt, being a physician, resuscitated me, and here I am. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. When you were on the other side, do you recall seeing any uh, other beings, angels or um, predeceased relatives, anything no, like that? No, no. Uh, I've read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of NDEs, and I know, and I've done research on it, and know that a lot of people do. But no, I just saw the the, the light of God was the only <laughs> the only one I saw. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it's interesting. I've heard many people describe a field, but never going into a mountain like that. Uh, yeah, it was, can the, you... the tunnel was in the mountain, and it and it was not scary at all. Uh, it was just very serene and peaceful, because you could see the light at the end of the tunnel. Ah, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, um, let, let me just... Uh, Ask one aside, because I had a similar experience when I was seven years old, I drowned. And after that, I was very interested in astronomy. Uh, I wanted my mother to buy me a telescope. I spent nights, you know, winter and summer out in the backyard looking at the moon and the stars and so forth. Did you have any kind of similar reaction to that? Well, I, I did, Lee. Um, excellent question. I think, I think, most of us who are open to this uh, have this profound change in our lives. Uh, within 30 minutes of my resuscitation, I was sort of lying on the edge of, of this uh, uh, hot springs, and God sort of came to me already the first time and through inner knowing and said, Neil, uh, you probably don't want to tell your parents about this. They would just say it's a hallucination. And for goodness sakes, I was about to enter the first grade. Don't tell your first grade students about this. They'll only <laughs> think you're a little weird. <laughs> yes. So, uh, but then profound changes happen, Lee, and, and we get this interest in things. And um, I started getting gifts that are psychic gifts. From from age five on, I I could communicate with animals. The first. The first gifts I received was that we we were on a ranch and and very we were still working with horses a lot and all at once I could communicate with these horses and our dogs and with the animals and that was the, the first of my my many blessings. And how was that community? This was a an intuitive knowing of what they were feeling or thinking, or were they able to think? Uh, uh, on a level with humans, to no, you? No, no. Their, their their thinking processes are are much simpler, but but it was a two way understanding. You know, I would I would say to the horses, and I being you know then six or seven, um, you know, you a team of horses driving a team of horses with a big wagon, and I would talk to the horses and say, well, here's where we're going to go, and you probably know as well as I do where we're going to go, and I'm a little young, but help me along here. <laughs> and and the, the horses would say, okay, that's cool, and you know, at that level. And, yes. and I just never had a bit of problem then with, with the horses and with the, you know, putting harnesses on them and that kind of thing. And I can remember my mother saying at, at that age, and it never, re, you know, I had to think about it later, my mother saying, gee, that Neil, he really, he really is good with horses and dogs. I mean, he, he really, you know understands them and and at the time I took the compliment of course but I didn't understand it completely to realize that I really did have that gift. <laughs> yes. And do you still have it as oh, you get older yeah. did you I, did sure. you keep that gift? And oh. and all and a lot of other gifts. Um certainly I was interested in science like you. Um my my next big uh breakthrough was 
at age 10 or 11, we all in our family were musicians, and I was sitting at the piano. I had listened to a popular song, and I thought that I could write a song like that. But I started out, and I stopped. And this is the first time that I sort of remember asking God for a favor. I said, help me write this song. And in 15 minutes, I had the melody and the harmony and three uh, sets of words. And I did it all in 15 minutes. And I showed it to my parents and brothers. And they said, you know, that's really good. And I simply could not have done that without his help. That was the first time. And then Hmm. later on, sort of God says to, again, this inner knowing, do you want to be psychic? Do you want to be telepathic? Do you want these things? And I said, well... I really don't understand them, but I'm open to them. I'm, I just open myself up to you, God. And he said, fine, I will, I will give you these gifts, but you will, you will use them for me and for humankind. You know, no, no going to the racetracks. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and how did, did you use them in, in your work as a scientist? Oh, gee, well, the, like the Nobel Peace Prize. That, all of that work comes out of than wanting to serve and wanting to just 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 be there for humankind and and the projects that that I was um, successful enough in my uh, work that I could I could choose particular projects and I chose them to be service projects if I could and um, I just devoted my life and my career to to being of service. And when did you first uh, feel free to talk about uh, your NDE with other people? Well, it was, um, I never told a soul for 30, 31 years, and I was at this shishi party of science, a new scientist for something in Georgetown, in Washington, D.C., and I was in one conversation group, and I heard another conversation group just a, a, a few steps away, used the word near-death experience. And I sort of exited my group and walked over, and I heard a lady say, well, there's this new book out by a a, a physician, psychiatrist by the name of Raymond Moody, and the book is Life After Life. And they were talking about this term I had never heard, near-death experience. I nearly, I nearly, my knees were shaking. I had never heard that word, of course. It was coined by Raymond Moody. And Mm -hmm. the next day, I went to the bookstore, and I sat down, though, Lee, I sat down, it was a nice spring day, and I sat down and went to my own NDE and remembered it as well as I could so that I wouldn't be influenced by, by others. And up to that time, I thought I was the only person that had ever had an NDE. But knowing that there's a book out about other people, and I went and purchased the book, and that was 1975. Mm-hmm. And... Uh... After that, did you uh, read more about, uh, I mean, many, many books have come out since Raymond Moody's book. Have you sort of kept pace with all of the uh, literature and other people's experiences? Yes, I have. Um, I started, I was busy in my career, but I started collecting books, and that's how I came across uh, Edgar Cayce. I began reading on people who had been changed dramatically, and uh, what I thought often was from from a near-death experience, and so I came across There is a River, uh, that that's, was one of the first books, or the first book written about Edgar Casey, and I got interested in him and others, and yes, I've been following, I did my master's uh, uh, culminating project on near-death experiences, and my doctoral thesis that I'm working on right now is on near-death experiences. So yes, I've <laughs> I've done a lot of research, especially in the last 10 years, uh, on near-death experiences. Well, that's great. I have a, a doctor of ministry in near-death experience from my seminary. Um, Neil, you're going to be speaking at our IONS conference in San Antonio over this coming Labor Day weekend um, on your research uh, about whether Edgar Cayce uh, had an, an NDE himself. and. Uh, so tell us how um, you got interested in pursuing that question. What, what you've discovered about Edgar Casey? Well, yes, when I when I began to read about Edgar Casey and the things that he did, and he also wanted to be of service. And and uh, soon after his near death experience at age five, very very similar to mine, 
uh, he told his mother that he wanted his life desire was to help children who were sick. And that's what he was going to devote his life to. Um, and reading to his life, he, he, was a, he was a normal human being that was psychic. I mean, he was fallible like all of us. But he could put himself in a near-death experience like trance. And in that trance, he could go to what he called the Akashic Records. We sometimes call it the Book of All Knowledge. And could... could um, tune in to the to events and to other and to the thinking of other people. He could tune in to to where people were. He could describe a sick child in uh, thousands of miles away. He could say, "You're lying in a bedroom. Your quilt is you know made like this, and you've got a lamp on your desk and uh, a picture on your wall." He could he could bring up those kinds of concepts. Uh, a thousand miles away, he had that ability, and then he could diagnose. This is a man who never had anything more than an eighth grade education, but he could diagnose the illness of these children, which he primarily uh, diagnosed, uh, especially in the earlier stages of his. They're called readings, and he would say, "This child is, uh, you know, has," and and he you would use medical terms that that an eighth grade educated man just simply wouldn't know. And he could give quite sophisticated diagnoses. And and he just did it again and again. He did it thousands of times. It's, it's all well documented. So I, I, you know, picked up on all yes. of this and then other things that were psychic experiences. Um, and a lot of them in his childhood after me. Let me go back, though, and explain a little bit of his near, near-death experience. So I, I realized he had to have had one, and I went back into the records of, his, of people who were writing about him while he was still alive. And one of his um, uh, biographers was a man by the name of Harmon Bro, B-R-O. And Harmon and, and his wife, Jane, lived with and worked for Edgar Cayce in the last year of his life, 1944. And when Edgar knew that Harmon was going to write his doctoral dissertation on, Ed, on Edgar's life, Edgar started giving him a lot of information about him to put it, that he wanted to make sure was in his, his biography. And so he told Harmon Bro, and it took me three or four readings of this book to find this because it was only one sentence in this entire book where Harmon Bro said, and Edgar told me, and it was a quote, Edgar told me that he had drowned as a boy and that he continued to see his little childhood mystic friends as an adult. And that was the entire sentence. But then when I realized that I had found it, he had drowned as a boy, then I went back into the records in the vault at the... Edgar Casey Association for Research and Enlightenment. And going through some of the early papers, I came across um, some writings of Edgar's father, Leslie Casey. And these uh, writings were paper and pencil. They were not dated, but they talked about this near-death experience. Edgar Casey had, at age around age five, had gone fishing in an area where they had a huge rain, rainstorm the day before that overflowed his little fishing area. And he went down there, and because the water was so high, he had forgotten that there was a sinkhole near that. This was the local fishing place for a lot of the hired men and, and, and uh, people in the area. So it was the well-known sinkhole, but Edgar fell into it, 10 to 12 feet deep, um, quite narrow, and I believe that he drowned. A hired man came along in a wagon and saw Edgar's hat floating on top of the sinkhole and suspected or knew that Edgar was down there and went and got him and I think gave him simple resuscitation. And from that time on, Edgar started to have his invisible playmates. He got visited by an angel and up to that point he had had trouble in school and he asked God for favor. He said, you know, God help me with my studies. And he could lie on a book 
and memorize the contents of the book. So from his NDE on, he, he picked up all of these gifts as well. And this pattern, these patterns, as you know, Lee, of, of the, of, from NDEs, we, we know that th these are the patterns that happen again and again and again. So my research has continued on that, and I, I really truly believe that, that Edgar Cayce had that NDE and that from that time on he got interested in religion, he wanted to buy a Bible, he, he devoted himself to, to, to children, and all of that followed. When he spoke of invisible playmates, uh, do you think he was speaking of angels? Yes, yes, he was speaking. Um, he would go out into a wooded area out behind his house, and uh, these invisible playmates, spirit guides, so to speak, or angels. And then there was, in one case, a true full-blown angel, as he described it, with wings and white and all of that. So yes, these were these were people from the other side who had come to visit him, and um, he had extended conversations and would play with his invisible playmates for uh, a couple of years. And then, as he said in this uh, uh, quote from Harmon Bro's book, A Seer Out of Season, uh, they came back and visited him once as an adult. Hmm. Do you suppose that uh, so many children have invisible playmates, or at least used to maybe before... Uh, tablets and uh, cell phones were invented. Uh, do you suppose that these are all uh, angels? That these are a manifestation of, of one form or another from the other side? Well, I, I certainly can, can come to that conclusion, Lee. I mean, if we, if we know in our NDE research, like Kenneth Ring talks about the, the number of people, and he, he has it up as high as 70% of children from childbirth and early children um, uh, maladies and illnesses have near-death experiences. And so it's, in, in my opinion, quite likely that these children have already acquired, again, the ability to, to cross over to the other side and find invisible playmates and see angels and all of that. I think that's that's... That's very likely and, and, and common in children who have had NDEs and don't fully uh, understand it. Mm. Now, you mentioned the Akashic Record or the, the Book of Life, and uh, you're, uh, one of the areas of your expertise is, was space-based communications. Do you suppose there'll be a time when we can develop a technology that would... Uh, interface with the Akashic Record the way Edgar Cayce was able to? Mm, Lee, that's a, <laughs> a wonderful question that, I'm, that I, we're not going to have time to get into today. That's, that's <laughs> one for San Antonio, I think, for, <laughs> for you and I. Um, we certainly are, there's a oneness that I believe we all have, our soulness, our oneness, and it allows us to communicate with each other. One of the abilities that I used throughout my career was the ability to, to to feel the inner knowing of of others and to know what they wanted from me and me and would like me to do for them even before they asked me it was it was one of the great blessings I had with my own boss I knew what he wanted me to do before he asked me to do it that really helps in your job by the way uh, if you have that ability and sure. so we, 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 all, we all have this oneness Lee and, and I think that, that at some point it, we will all become more comfortable with our psychic abilities and we will all not, but I mean some people will always not be comfortable with it but more and more of us I think will and we will begin to communicate more and more telepathically and um, and with that will come a lot of inner knowledge and inner knowing. Mm. I, I can't help but note the the parallel between the horses that knew what you wanted them to do and the boss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and your reading of the boss's uh, wishes as well. It's it's like a, almost a a, a chain of um, uh, a hierarchy of of wishes and trying to fulfill the. Uh, the, the wishes of the person that uh, is in charge of things. Yes. 
Uh, now, if we could do that, if we could do that with God directly, we'd all be living much better lives than we are right now. Yeah. If we could just re- tap into that. I, I, I had one other question about, you know, they're always talking about, um, if your name is written in the book of life, uh, and a lot of people take that to mean the Bible, but, uh, it might be that if we, uh, are not, if we don't make an entry of some sort into the Akashic record, something notable, um, that maybe that's the book of life that everyone, that people are referring to when they talk about, you know, their, the hereafter and their, uh, existence in the hereafter. Yeah, I think, uh, it is all of our stored experiences are are captured in in that book of life and so that if we can access that we we can access the experiences and feelings of everyone uh so it it is it it is really big but but as we know it's not beyond the the uh, you know the concepts of 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 god and 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 one and so it it, I, I, I certainly believe in it. Mm. But you feel that it's something apart from God? Oh no, no, gracious, no! Oh no, no! It's, it's, it's absolutely a part of God. It's part of God's will that all of this is there for us. And at some point, uh, in, in Edgar's case, he was able to to access it, and I think uh, some of us access it to some extent, and and um, and and others will. More and more in the future. Hmm. Would you call it the mind of God then, or a part of the I, mind? Well, I of think God? that's a good way of putting it, Lee. Sure, of course. I, I, I and I know we're running out of time. I, I, I sometimes um, uh, get frustrated with people who try to, uh, as fallible pe- beings, think that we know what God's all about, and we, we judge Him using that word with our fallible you know, judgments, but he yes. certainly has the ability to be bigger than all of that and as we know, all knowing and universal and anything that like that 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 he wants to happen will certainly happen. Mm. Well, uh, Neil, you are right about our running out of time. Was there anything else that you wanted to uh, to add to uh, this discussion? Well, I certainly that you can fit into people. about uh, a minute. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I certainly encourage people to come to San Antonio. I'm excited about it. I've come. I've been to NDE conferences before, and I'm always enlightened. And uh, I, I just love the community. It's a it's a wonderful, loving, spiritual community of people, and uh, I have such a good time. And so I encourage uh, our listeners to uh, to come to San Antonio in, in early September and and attend the conference. It really is amazing. You get into a room where perhaps 50% of the people have had near-death experiences or similar mystical uh, experience and it's uh, it's electric sometimes you know you can uh, you can go in and uh, feel the energy level rise in your life and and in the room itself it's it's quite powerful i found it to be yes, at any I rate agree. <laughs> i agree <laughs> neil have you done any writing about uh, about your nde or um, uh, yeah or any I, of this I, the uh, the the uh, vital signs of the the monthly book, which, by the way, your article was in this last issue. It was excellent. Uh, I yes. have the uh, lead article, I don't know, about a year ago now, on Edgar Cayce's uh, NDE, <laughs> and I've published in the Journal of Near-Death Studies uh, and have another new publication that will be there <clears throat> in one of the future editions, and uh, my own doctoral th- uh, dissertation that's coming up will, I believe, get published uh in also the Journal of Near-Death Studies. Excellent. I look forward to that. Well, Neil, thank you so much for your research and for sharing your own NDE. Um, I hope you'll all out there be able to come and meet and talk with Neil at the upcoming IONS Conference in San Antonio. If you would like to listen to this show again or any other of our previous programs, please visit our website at nderadio.org. And for more information about IANS, please check that website at iands.org. There will be information on that site about our upcoming Labor Day weekend conference in San Antonio on NDEs as rites of passage. And that's from September 3rd through 6th. Neil will be there, and I look forward to seeing you there as well. Thanks for listening.